welcome to Ask the Educator, a podcast brought to you by Healthmark Industries. Are you a sterile processing technician or manager? Maybe you work in infection prevention or biomedical engineering. Whether you're a frontline tech, endoscopy tech, OR nurse, or surgical services administrator, you undoubtedly have influence in medical device processing at your facility. In each episode, we speak with experts from the Healthmark Clinical Affairs team, industry leaders, or special guests from the trenches to answer your questions and bring you relevant industry information, equipping you for excellence in medical device processing. My name is Kevin Anderson, and I will be your host. Now let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Ask the Educator podcast. This is Kevin Anderson, your host. Joining me, uh, my co-host as usual, Adam Okada. Adam, thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. All right, Adam, this is a this is a kind of an unusual episode. We have multiple guests with us, and this one's going to be about kind of highlighting a, a pretty landmark project uh, for HSPA. They teamed up with uh, the Ofsted Group, and so here with us, uh, starting us off, kind of give us the the background of this project is Damian Berg. So, Damian, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being here and bringing on this uh, these other team members as well to share their experience with this. Well, thank you very much, Kevin and Adam, uh, for doing this, and of course, obviously, thank you, Healthmark. For being a great partner uh, with HSPA and, and giving us another platform to share our message and to highlight our outstanding members, you know this is like you said, it is a landmark. It's a it's a watershed event for HSPA because for years we've always we know a lot of different things that we do, but we always want to back it up with evidence. We want to back it up with science. And we want to back it up with data. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when I started with HSPA, I, I talked to the leadership and the team and says, "How can we start doing this?" and we got with the foundation, which is our nonprofit wing of HSPA, to see if there's a re- way we can basically fund research, working with our different industry partners, and to find a topic that will really resonate with our people, but also that will actually bring value and, and can carry on past the year. It's not just something like, oh, that was really cool they did, but it's actually something we can use. So when we talked to Ofsted, uh, Corey Ofsted and her associates, uh, we met with them and we came up with a concept of training because we all know and and i kind of thought of the the concept a little bit myself because i am still a per diem sterile processing tech for the university of colorado and i go in once a year for my annual competencies but i also work there when i can um when i'm not traveling on the road and i build trays i work econ i I work with my staff and i i also advise them on several things but how competent am i you know not doing it day in day out and how a competent, you know, when I train them, how long does it last? And we didn't really know that. So we started to come up with a concept and we picked a topic of flexible endoscopes because obviously it's a hot topic, but it's also a complex topic. So we picked the topic of flexible endoscopes, visual inspection internally and externally using borescope as well as light magnification. And from that, then we uh, designed a study and, and uh, designed the test and designed the methods. Um, and then we recruited. And uh, the best part about the recruiting is we found technicians, HSPA technicians around the country that had you know little or no formal endoscope training. They could not be CER or any kind of endoscope trained or certified. And they may have done endoscopes, but they didn't have any formal education. It was more like OJT. And uh, we wanted to make sure we, we got those kind of groups. So we got them from across the country, East Coast, West Coast, Central, you name it. And we brought them together last year, September, um, to Minneapolis, to Ofsted's uh, research um, headquarters. And we did the training for a day and a half. And then over the last year, we've done subsequent follow-on trainings and education sessions and data, really data diving on how they're doing in their uh, facilities. And it's really exciting to see where that data started and now where it's at almost a year after the study. Um, and I'll share some of that at the end when we talk about next steps and what we're doing. But I really wanted to be about two of our outstanding participants um, that are on the call with us today and really have them talk to us about their experiences, not only during the training, maybe before the training. I'd like to hear that. Actually, we haven't talked about that. It was like when they got asked what that means to them. Uh, and then as well as during the training. And then, of course, over the last nine, 10 months when they're back in the real world, actually utilizing what the skills they were taught. Um, and uh, we'll kind of go from there. But I definitely will hand it back to you, Kevin, and uh, let's hear from the trainees. And uh, I will be in the background uh, just listening and observing and and enjoying. 
All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Damien. I appreciate you setting that up for us. And why don't we go ahead and get started uh, with Sarah, Sarah Cruz. I'm sure a lot of you out there are familiar with Sarah. Uh, She's very active uh, with HSPA, but also on social media and all that. So Sarah, welcome to the show again. I believe you've been on way back when, actually. It's been a while, but uh, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Kevin. A luxury I like having. Thanks for having me. So, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and um, just kind of explain to us how you got involved in this project and then, you know, maybe share one of the one of the lessons learned along the way. Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, initially, when the project was brought to my attention, I was almost inclined to say no, just because that's a big part that Damien pointed out in the beginning, was that you had to own to the fact that you probably didn't know a lot about endoscope reprocessing. And um, I have a lot of letters after my name. And while they all mean CSS nerd, I do not have CER after my name, because I have started and stopped studying for that test because of overwhelm. And, you know, typically being in a uh, bone and joint institute, you don't really do too much with the endoscopes in that type of way. So I was initially like, why would I put myself in a situation to uh, highlight what I don't know to the masses? But then after Damien explained the, you know, implications that could have for our industry, I got to check the ego at the door and get in there and do what's best to elevate sterile processing amongst the healthcare industry. And I feel so excited to be a part of something that brought sterile processing to white paper documents and data and, you know, the infection prevention journals. And that's what it's all about with, you know, making sure sterile processing can resonate amongst these other professions that contribute the same way to patient safety. Overall, it's been like a 180 view on uh, self and uh, promotion of industry. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, that's awesome. You know, uh, I was very in a very similar situation. I started in sterile processing. I primarily did instrumentation. I was not really familiar with flexible scopes. Now, I had done like TEE probes and I'd done certain things that were kind of in the realm, but I'd never really focused on the flexible scopes. And then one of the jobs that I got was as a supervisor of HLD. And I really got kind of thrown into the fire of flexible endoscopes, not really having a lot of background in it. So I I can completely understand what you're talking about. And I kind of want to uh, throw this next question to our guest, uh, Sandra Hilliard, who's here from Memorial Hermann. And uh, Sandra, how did you hear about this project and what made you decide to want to do it? I heard about the project from my regional director, Tim Hurtado, and he encouraged me to get on board and um, expand my horizons. Um, so I did, and I was much like Sarah, um, kind of reluctant because specialty clinic that does all of the scopes. So we have very few that we handle, um, and I can count them on both hands, I would say, but I did jump on board. Um, I was very excited and kind of curious at the same time to see what I would learn. And I knew that I would take something away from this. Um, so I was pleasantly surprised. I met an awesome team, learned a lot, and was able to bring things back to share um, and still share today. So it was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this um, white paper study and the research and everything that we've learned. So, Sandra, I'm going to stick with you for a minute here, but I just wanted to point out that I can't tell you how, how glad I am that you guys actually focused on inspection of flexible endoscopes because I was actually uh, um, managing a, uh, an endoscopy area uh, when I was still in the hospital. And we were probably, I don't know, I guess you could say maybe an early adopter of borescope examination and flexible endoscopes. And this was before Olympus put out what, you know, the pictures of what it looks like in a normal scope. And this was before there was tons of, you know, educational content on it. And I can't tell you how difficult it was uh, to implement a borescope inspection point. Uh, we had so many questions. We had people stop in the line. We had like, initially, I think the entire scope fleet was being sent for repair, you know, like, <laughs> like what is going on, you know? Uh, and so we had a lot of well-meaning uh, technicians looking through there, but what we should be looking for, uh, what stood out and, you know, obviously how to train each other really, which is the basic thing. You know, we sometimes as a manager and I, I you know, I'm guilty of this. Sometimes I think, Oh, just buy the technology, uh, you know, teach them why it's important. And, 
the rest will take care of itself and it and it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't take care of itself usually there's a lot of hiccups along the way so i i was really interested uh when this when this thing got published to see what uh you guys would have to say so so sandra what would you say uh, you know you you mentioned that you were able to take some things back like what is it that st- stood out to you that that is going to actually change your practice? It's, it sounded like you're the manager. So what are you going to do differently? Well, let me say this. Um, your story sounds a lot like mine. As a manager, most things are hands off. We're hands on when there's a fire. We need to jump in. Right. But for the most part, we're hands off. We get something in there. We go through the in-services. We get the IFUs. We create, we create super users. Or, and we get the trainers to train. And we get all of the people that are super users to train others. And we do competencies. But as we know, people kind of tend to fall off and do things their way kind of a thing. And we were in the same boat. And at the time that this happened, it couldn't have happened at a more opportune time. I can honestly say, and I'm going to be totally transparent, that most of our fleet was out for repair. And we were looking at loaners, you know, and loaners themselves. And what I've learned through all of this process was that even loaners that come in, we have to inspect those too, right? This is something that was not a part of our practice, right? So we were just running them through the process. We didn't have a boroscope. Um, as a matter of fact, when this came upon me, as far as this opportunity, we got our first boroscope. So when I went off and took this training and met Damien and Sarah and the rest of the team, and I wish they were here, I learned everything and everything, all of the pieces kind of came together for me. Um, so when I came back, I was able to use the boroscope with the information that was given to me and to teach my super users how to properly inspect what to look for, how to inspect the scope, name off all of the parts. So it was amazing to watch the team also do those hands-on things and create files that are so important when we're going through um, our scopes. So you have a file for each and every scope now, you know, and my super users are hands-on with everything. And if I need to jump in there too. I can do it too. So this is my takeaway that I'm able to inspect properly and I know what I'm looking for. And I can speak to the manufacturer and say, hey, this is what happened. This is what I found. This is where I saw it. You know, so being able to speak to my the processes and what I've learned is so important. So Kevin, I, I know it's not my turn to speak, but I'm, I'm going to go in anyway. I use that privilege. Is that okay? Of course, Damien, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know me, I've never met a microphone I don't like. But um, so one thing I want Sandra to highlight, she's being very humble here. There's two things that I really would like to point out on this is during her uh, initial return to her hospital, she not only you get training and we say, okay, we're documenting and we're doing good, we're inspecting, but do can you actually relate what we're doing to true patient outcomes? And I want her to tell that story about what she found and what she did and what she received from her healthcare system, because it really is impressive and it shows the power of what we're doing. It's not just a flash in a pan. It really does relate back to the patient. That's what we're here for. And then secondly, you know, talk about there's another side effect that we didn't even count on doing this training is some potential cost savings on repairs. We afterwards, we found that out, too, because a lot of people, there's a narrative out there. I spoke with a lot of people and they're like, oh, my God, our repairs are going to go through the roof and everybody's, nobody's going to want to do this because they can't afford anything. So, Sandra, briefly talk to me about those two things, because they're very an interesting part of what we do here. And that can really expand and, and hopefully create some excitement among people that will eventually get to where you guys are at. So I'm going to it's two parts because this is really exciting for me because when we were doing the inspection on one of our scopes, and like remember, most of our fleet was already out. So we had one scope that we we actually owned, and it was a third party that we bought. I was inspecting the scope because my staff or my super user said that there was a leak. So I had taken it upon myself to inspect the scope, and we sent it out for repair. And I got a phone call the following day saying that they couldn't um, – they couldn't – find the leak. And they had been trying to locate what I said was a leak for four hours. 
Um, my response to the technician was, okay, so you're telling me you cannot reenact the leak that I'm saying that we saw, and you've been holding my scope underwater. And he said, yes, we've been doing this for four hours. And I'm saying to him, I said, okay, so send it back to me, and I'm going to show you where it was. And I said, it's in the body, right at the handle where you articulate. About an hour later, we got off the phone. An hour later, he called me back and he said, you know what? He said, we found it. I said, right. I said, because I have a picture showing that the seal is cracked right there. You can't really see it, but the boroscope picked it up. And he said, you know what? You were right. I said, so you flooded my scope for four hours. And he said, well, I tell you what, we're going to do the repair for free. And he did, you know, so that was amazing. Not only did that happen, but in all of this, while our whole fleet is out for repair and it's the winter and, you know, this is the most critical time for us to have scopes out and we have loaners in, um, we do have a budget for repairs, you know. And at that moment and at that time, um, we were way over budget because, as we know, those are not um, small ticket items. You know, they're quite expensive. Come back to um, my home base, and we start looking at the fleet. The loaners start going back. Our scopes start coming back in. As they're coming back in, we're inspecting those, and we're creating files for each and every one of them, you know. And when we start looking back now, it's been about, what, six, seven months, maybe more, that I've been back. Um, cost savings-wise, I can tell you that since I got back, we've sent out two scopes. So, yes, we're behind the eight ball as far as our budget. It is blown, but I can say moving forward, we're going to start saving money because most of the repairs that we're catching now is like $2,000. Yeah, and you're seeing a you're seeing a downward trend is what you're saying yeah. now in terms of cost. Yeah. That's interesting. Wow. So what, do you, what would you attribute that to, do you think? Obviously, you guys are able to catch things. Is it because they're catching things quicker or is it because they're catching it and then and then they're able to educate their each other on where the damage is coming from and and sort of, you know, prevent people from bad practices? I mean, is that what it is or maybe we're still learning about that? I think it's a I think it's a confidence that they have now in knowing what they're doing, why they're doing it and how to do it and then having the tools to do it. Um, I think that's what it is. Um, so they look forward to um, inspections now. That's awesome. I, I don't I, we were getting to that point, but we still you know, there was some people who were, you know, a little shaky with it. But, you know, I wanted to tease out a little detail because you keep saying you built files for these things. And I think this is a really this could be a really good detail for people listening. What do you mean when you're building files for each scope? Well, within the program, and it is a Windows program, I just opened up files. And as I took my pictures and videos, I downloaded them into that file. And each file has a name, and it's related to the serial number of each of the scopes in the facility. That's a very simple thing that people can do to document their inspections using the the computers that are already uh, at their disposal, no fancy instrument tracking. You're just using files on your on your Windows PC. So uh, I think that was a nice little detail to to share with others out there, especially if you have a uh, if you're equipped with a bore scope that does take pictures and videos. That's one of the one of the values in that. So any other last things that you would like to share, Sandra, from what you learned that that maybe we haven't hit on yet. I think that anytime someone has the opportunity to get into a research group of any sort, they should take the opportunity. Not only do you walk away with valuable information, but just the people that you meet along the way that you can reach out to is amazing and it's priceless. Excellent. Yeah, I would definitely second that. Any chance you get to be a part of something like this, especially Ofsted and Associates, I can't imagine that's got to be a pretty rare circumstance for somebody to kind of team up with them. And and what a great learning experience that that would be. So uh, I'm glad you did it. I don't know how they got you to uh, to come along on that journey, but what a great project to be a part of. So, Sarah, I want to come back to you real quick. Just wanted to give you the opportunity to share what is the main thing that you would want to share with people who might be listening? 
Sure. I think that my biggest takeaway from all of this is the power of universal training and standard works, really just demonstrating that training is difficult. But when we do different initiatives to lower the threshold to onboard for specific training and best practice implementation in the workplace through techniques like this we did in Ofsted, it really makes for welcoming people into wanting to learn more. Training's hard. Learning's hard. Nobody likes to admit that they don't know something. And sometimes we never do, right, Kevin? So we're (laughs) fortunate out there, right? But truly, when you look at this, like even the ease of use of technology, just being able to build the files that Sandra was speaking of, I'm probably the worst millennial out there and can't get into a Teams meeting for 20 minutes to save my life. And I'm sorry if I'm late. So the beauty of having really easy technology takes down that inhibitor, that barrier where it's like, well, I can't do this. I've never even seen this borescope. And then, you know, you get a defunct millennial like me that's building files uploading images, demonstrating them to C-suite, being able to become that subject matter expert because of training modules already put in place. Again, low threshold, common language, easy applied, which doesn't just work for our C-suite friends, common language and uh, you know, repet- uh, repetitive rhetoric. It works for training as well, whereas I've never spoken about you know, cracks in a handle and leaks and flooding my scope. And, you know, I've never used phrases like that before. And now they're common knowledge. And they, because they're so easily transitioned in through training modules and standard works, they can be transcended from us to the front line, to the C-suite. And I think that was my favorite part about the entire process was essentially creating a pitch to your C-suite when you were done. So not only did the training afford us the ability to walk the walk and talk the talk, dare I say, but allowed us to walk and talk into those boardrooms that we typically don't have seats at as sterile processing professionals to tell them what is happening with the scopes that could be endangering patients outside of an Excel spreadsheet. Because, you know, C-suites, love language is the spreadsheet, right? Like who, I've never met anybody in C-suite that doesn't like Excel. So when Excel you is great. Excel is great. Yeah. Right? Listen, I'll make tables in Microsoft Word all day before I Excel, but I understand. We'll, count on, we'll count on you, Kevin. Okay. So, you know, when you can walk into these spaces that you're not typically used to having a seat at and feel confident and they view you as that professional that they're resting their professional integrity on, that was my favorite part of the whole Corey Offset HSPA Foundation support of this project was not just teaching us how to be smart, but showing us how to relay the important facts to facilitate change. Because that's what it's all about, right? It doesn't matter what you know, because it's all just information until you apply it, because then it's knowledge. I think that was Einstein. That wasn't me. That's for sure. So you would say that this whole project was it equipped you to be, you know, come in and speak to, you know, the key stakeholders, C-suite leadership with more credibility and more confidence and more effectiveness. I mean, what more could you ask for, right? I mean, this is stuff that's very important, not only with, you know, flexible endoscopes, but in just about everything we do. Every, I go all over the place and people are, they have one of this or one of that. And it's like, you know, you need more than one of things you know you need like you got to be able to articulate your needs and and go to the right places so uh what a great outcome uh from from this uh project and so that being said i wanted to come back to you damien i know we want to share with people about this about this project now it's been published in hspa's recent process magazine which you know if you're a member of hspa which is that, uh, you know, when you go and you get your certifications, there's that just, what is it, little $10, right? right. $10 membership fee. You're correct. That gives, that gets you the access to process. You can get it in the mail. You can get it on the web page when you log in. Uh, but also, there is a QR code in there that you can scan and get right to the actual AGIC article, Right. Am I saying all this correctly? Yeah. And we definitely encourage everyone to get into the to the actual meat and potatoes because the the one that is in HSPA right now is kind of the snapshot overview, right? And then the one in the AGIC 
uh, American Journal of Infection Control it is the entire study laid out for everybody, right? Correct. And yeah, we decided uh, early on in this is when we applied for this is to one of the, the I want to say gifts, one of the things we did is make sure that we paid for it to be free download and access to anybody and everybody, not just members, mm. anybody and everybody. I don't care what profession you're in, you can download it for free. We paid for that part of our grant money from the foundation. So yeah, you can see that QR code and scan it. It's also on our social media links. It's out there. Uh, and then you can even just look it up in the AJIC itself. It's in its April edition. Um, so it's really exciting that that we can we can share that stuff with them. You can really read it and you can start development. What we're going to be doing next with this, and that's a perfect segue, uh, Kevin, is you know, we want to we're still collecting data on on where and when training starts to degrade. So when does it start to when do you start to drop off and start losing those skills? Even if you're doing something, skills are perishable. And it, whether it's a complex task like a flexible endoscope or doing your uh, daily uh, washer validations or whatever, whatever skills we have in our department, they are perishable. So at what point do you need to look at redoing your competencies? But more importantly, using the new HSPA Ofsted training model, because we believe that makes it stickier and cement in people's brains. And we're and that's what we're proving with the data. That's what we're proving with the research. So we're almost done with that data collection for one year. And then we're going to come out with another uh, push of information for everybody to say, this is what we, you know, this is what we found. We know it's working. Now we want the data to back it up because everybody is going to want to, you know, prove it. And I think what we're going to do is my hope, my goal and my hope is, is a HSPA conference in Las Vegas, 2024. Uh, we're hoping to implement that as part of a training program for educators and other people there. Now, there's a whole lot of logistics. That's not saying it's going to happen yet because it's got to be in there, but that's, I'll push hard at it. But it's uh, basically we want to give some people to take home with them. And we're going to work with industry partners such as Healthmark and other other industry partners to say how can they spread the message out there when their, their uh, educational people like an Adam is out doing his uh, training for departments, can he use our model to do his in-services to make it the, 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 the knowledge stick better? And then, of course, when he leaves, they can still use that same model that Ofsted and HSPA uh, members came up with to continue that training. So that's kind of the end goal in this. And then we're going to keep hopefully expanding, almost like train a trainer, a lot of different things that we have planned in, in the network. But I want to get all the data in. I want to I want to see it all first, be able to prove it. Because what we don't want to do is say, well, this works really good. And then all of a sudden we're like, well, we got three more months. And man, we should have went, went a different direction. Um, but so far, the hypothesis that uh, Corey Ofsted and myself had are proving solid. And uh, now we're just going to put some meat on that bone over in, in the next six months and see where that goes. But you'll you'll be hearing more from us for sure. And by the way, this is not the only HSPA research project we, uh, in the pipeline. We've got other ones coming up. And that's the power of HSPA. That's the power of HSPA's foundation, um, both board of directors, and more importantly, the membership. That's one thing I didn't cover on there. And you mentioned a little bit about that $10 extra. To be part of this, and how did Sandra get picked? How did Sarah? How did the others get picked? Not only were they certified CRCST, but they also had to be members. So membership has its benefits, and that's what I want to tell you. That ten dollars extra year goes a long way to get all those little extra things that nobody else gets. And that's one of the skills we wanted to make sure we honor, recognize, and reward our certificates and our members. So HSPAs, we're going to continue challenging the status quo. We're going to continue growing, and we cannot cannot do it without standing members and certificates like the two we're talking to today and sponsors and partners like you guys at help thank you damien well said and uh i want to thank you sarah thank you sandra for joining us what an amazing project i i hope that there's a lot of people out there that are already looking into this and i i look forward to what might be what might be coming in the future there damien i i you dropped some hints there and i can't tell you i mean as somebody who's tried a lot of different things, you know, as a manager to try and train somebody uh, more effectively, um, it it is not a it's not as uh, straightforward as people assume, I think. And then I've seen things done where it's like you're going through yearly competencies and it becomes very sort of just <laughs> like like a like a. I don't know, just a simple checkbox checklist where somebody's not really demonstrating things. And we we need to get away from that. I think that's part of the 
uh, part of the problem, you know, and part of the reason why, you know, our skills decay and our understanding decays a little bit over time. And so I think this is going to be really valuable uh, to the industry. And so really appreciate the work and uh, from all of you. And Adam, I, you know, I should give you a chance here to get any last thoughts in uh, before we wrap up. Yeah, I agree with everything that you just said. I mean, the the opportunity to do this for HSPA members is huge to participate in things like this that HSPA does. And then the what you guys have is so valuable. Um, what the, the members were able to take away from that project and able to help their facilities train and be a little bit more uh, in tune with what we're actually doing with flexible endoscopes and whatever is going to come in the future. So uh, incredibly exciting stuff uh, from HSPA. And thank you guys for being on the podcast. So with that said, I think that's all. That's that's a wrap. And uh, again, we appreciate your uh, volunteering, obviously, for the project, but also for sharing it here on the podcast platform. We hope that it reaches a lot of ears and and people learn some valuable lessons from the the project that you guys participated in and and shared with us. Thank, thank you both. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Kevin, for having us. Bye. All opinions expressed on this show are those of the presenters. Before using any medical device, it is important to review the device manufacturer's instructions for use.